Welcome to our webinar. Uh, our topic is EPPT recast and um, IEQ. Uh, so we speak about indoor environmental quality in the context of the EPPT recast. Uh, this is quite a big challenge indeed. We all know that um, improving energy performance, especially in existing building, when it is very easy to compromise ventilation and air quality. And that's why these IQ topics have been addressed in the, in the directive. And this is, and, and how this can be done and how it is done in, in Europe in different countries. So this is a topic of uh, today's webinar. Uh, it, it is also a um, month of IEQ in the build-up portal and um, RIFA uh, Federation of the European Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Associations is organizing this webinar together with other organizations like Eurovent, EVIA, EP and others. So um, uh, please go to the program of a webinar. I, I would be happy to introduce our speakers. Uh, so today we will have uh, two main presentations. Uh, first of these will be by Pavel Vargotsky. He is a professor from TTU Denmark. And another presentation uh, dealing with, especially with uh, uh, changes introduced in, in the re recast will be by Klaus Handel, and he is a technical secretary from EVIA. And after that, we will continue with panel discussion where, uh, where we have uh, uh, quite, quite many, many persons in, in the panel, and when it is also a possibility for the audience uh, to, to have a questions. I, I think these questions is so that you need to type your, your question. It is not possible to speak. Here you can see our panelists uh, and um, we have reserved um, maybe, maybe a bit less than one hour for the panel because I ex expect these presentations can, can take a slightly longer time uh, and after the panel, there is a concluding remark by Risto Kosonen, vice, vice president of, of RIFA. Uh, but, but yes, it's possible to have a questions for, for our uh, main speakers and to the panel. And uh, please use this um, chat to give these uh, questions to us. So um, with this introduction, we are moving to our first presentation. Uh, this is um, by Pavel Vargotsky. Uh, Pavel is from TTU Denmark and has worked many years with uh, uh, indoor air, uh, let's say different questions. What are implications when we speak about um, adverse health effects what, what are the impacts on the productivity, learning performance, all these complicated topics and how this is, uh, should be dealt when we speak about energy performance of the buildings, when it is very important to integrate the energy use and indoor environmental uh, performance. So, uh, Pavel, uh, floor is yours or screen is yours for this um, important overview presentations about the IAQ importance. Please go on. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Pavel Vargowski speaking uh, from uh, Lingbe, which is north of Copenhagen, a campus of the Technical University of Denmark, where I am professor here and have been, you probably know, many of you know me, but I have been investigating uh, the importance of specifically indoor air quality and thermal environment on cognitive performance, but generally the importance for uh, our well-being uh, and life quality um, of, of building occupants. 
So I will give you a little bit of an overview of the importance of uh, IEQ, which stands for Indoor Environmental Quality, and I'll come back to this. What uh, are the elements of this uh, um, in, of indoor environmental quality are? <clears throat> and I give an overview. I don't have much time to talk about the details. And some of you have uh, listened to my presentation, but I think it's not enough to speak once. It's probably not enough to speak twice, and not even enough, enough even speak three times about this. We need to repeat it over and over again. Uh, how important uh, the topic is and how important the topic is, particularly now when we have a conversion of the entire building stock and new challenges that are uh, created by the risks of the pandemic in the future and the new infection, uh, viral infections and also uh, change, changes in the climate where we need to protect us against uh, those new uh, challenges in the future. So I'll try to address this in a general terms uh, in my presentation and give you an overview why this is important and why it has to become a part of any regulation that regulates the uh, uh, conditions of the buildings. Should it be conditions with respect to the technical solutions in the buildings or should it be uh, with respect to the uh, energy use of the buildings, which is actually the uh, the main aim of the EPVD. So, okay. It should work, but I mean, okay, it works. So this is the, uh, so I am um, affiliated at the Technical University of Denmark. That uh, department is DTU Sustain, which is environmental engineering um, Department and then at the International Center for Inter Environmental and Energy. So let's start with some uh, context and basics here. So we all know that we are coming from the outdoor environment and uh, that we can discuss what is our origin, but uh, most of us will agree that our origin is uh, in the warm uh, climates uh, outdoors. So our habitat in the past uh, was for years uh, the outdoor environment, but our new habitat is actually indoor environment. So most of our time that we spend uh, is in the buildings. In the buildings, we spend 85% of our time. Mostly we spend in the residential buildings, and this is represented by here, if you see on the arrow, by this part, and I'll come back to this in a moment. And of that, one of the third time of, of uh, our life is spent actually in our bedrooms when we sleep. Then we spend uh, uh, the rest of the time in public buildings. That could be our workplace. That could be the places where we go for the amusement, for shopping, and uh, that could be also schools. And then some of the rest of the time we spend actually in um, um, transport, where we move from one place to another, and then the rest is outside. If we try to decode those numbers and look at what does it mean in the percentages all years. So in, in, if we live 79 years, which is an average lifetime of a male EU, I hope that uh, every one of us will live longer, but nevertheless, of that 79 years, uh, only six years is spent uh, outdoors. And six, 69 years is um, in the buildings and 55 years we spent in the residential buildings. And 20, 26 years when we spent when we sleep. Of which, and also of which 79 years, we spent four years in commuting. So basically, what um, what is our exposure, our exposure, and most of the exposures that we get, and most of the impact of the environment that we get is in the buildings. And of course, that could be both the environment that is coming from outdoors, because the outdoor environment will affect the environment indoors, but also how is the environment in the building. So both those influences are there. So. Okay, 
our exposures in buildings are dominant, and particularly if we think about the, the air exposure, it, this is a dominant pathway in, in comparing to the other pathways. So if we compare it to the amount of water that we drink or the amount of food that we uh, eat, basically um, the amount of air that we inhale a day is orders of magnitudes uh, more. So exposures in buildings are dominant exposures for us, and we need to make sure that those exposures do not create any risks for us uh, when we are in uh, the buildings. That is uh, an important topic because uh, also we have to consider that buildings uh, uh, where we spend our time use a lot of energy. So in order to create indoor environment, the risk exists that we would like to uh, we would like we want to reduce the energy that is used in the buildings. Currently, the buildings use forty percent. That is about. Uh, 36 percent of all EU CO2 emissions are the buildings, um, and mainly these are residential buildings, but also commercial and public service buildings. So, in order to reduce the energy, the risk exists that during this process, or this process should not take in, should not um, compromise the conditions in the buildings. Of course, when we speak about the energy. Uh, that is our CO2 emission of the energy, we should also use the whole life CO2. And there is a lot of discussion about the whole life CO2. So any uh, retrofit or renovations that relate to the reduction of the energy use in buildings or uh, any retrofits that uh, relate to the uh, uh, improving or uh, uh, changes of the indoor environmental quality in buildings should also take into account the whole life CO2 or the uh, built uh, CO2 inside the materials and the processes to create that uh, uh, renovation. So when we look at this uh, aspect of sustainability, we need to uh, consider not only buildings, um, but also humans. And if we look at the uh, definition of sustainable, of sustainability, uh, so sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromise the ability of future generations. So if we only focus on one element, say energy and buildings, and we forget humans, we will create potentially the risks for the future generations that they will be living in the conditions that uh, create the risk for any of the aspects that I will be speaking about in a moment. So certainly buildings must be climate neutral and uh, that is obtained by minimizing their carbon footprint when they are constructed, retrofitted and operated. But also buildings must ensure at the same time conditions that do not create the risks for health and promote health and healthy behaviors of their occupants. And these are the two elements that have to go hand in hand and any documentation on any regulation or any retrofit, any re recommendation that or guideline that is made for the uh, to uh, um, regulate the, con uh, the, uh, the energy use in buildings should take into account the second bullet point, and uh, so to make sure that those uh, this aspect is not compromised by no means. When we speak about the buildings. We have to take into account or about indoor environmental quality. We need to take into account all elements of indoor environmental quality. So all major parameters uh, impacting indoor environmental quality are relevant for our for the conditions in the buildings, which we call indoor environmental quality. And these are aspects of thermal environment, of indoor air quality, of light environment, and acoustic. We have so far, not much understanding on how they um, interact uh, or how they, they interact. So, on their combined effects, uh, there is all, only some information about this, but we have enough information to regulate uh, specifically each of them. So, there is enough information that supports that they need to be at the very high quality. Why is that? Because um, the quality in buildings affects all aspects of our living, from aspects, of course, of comfort uh, here and well-being, 
and our health, uh, to which I uh, do not have to convince anyone, but also to aspects of work, learning, and sleep. The sleep aspect is the new element that has not been earlier discussed, but also create, uh, there is a clear connection between those aspects and the sleep quality. And the information that we have is that the, the effects on those aspects of life are not non-negligible, which means we speak about um, losses if the air qual indoor environmental quality is poor of losses to uh, reaching up to 5 to 15 percent on work performance, on learning of children. And also, uh, there is an aspect of increased absenteeism and presenteeism in offices because um, of the poor indoor environmental quality. We also have a new data that showed that the, if indoor environmental quality is, uh, is poor, then there, is, there are effects on sleep. Sleep is disturbed uh, by um, um, and poor, and then that has significant consequences on health and cognitive performance, or might have the significant consequences, which are very costly. So, if we look at those numbers, there are considerable subsequent economic implications of those numbers. And those uh, implications uh, are actually presented here on this graph to the right, that show that in, if we consider all the costs of operating the building, the major cost of any of, uh, building is the uh, cost of people in the building. So if we talk about um, modest gains in work performance, they can deliver significant financial benefits. Uh, usually those financial benefits are, um, those financial benefits, sorry, I need to go back. Th those financial benefits are, uh, can be paid back very quickly. We talk about the payback times of below two years, usually below one year. And also if with regards to sleep, too short sleep, it's less than seven hours of disturbed sleeps can cause up to six working days lost per year. So it is a very important significant implication of that. There is also considerable health effects of poor indoor environmental quality. Here we only present the estimates for um, air quality uh, effects on health that can reach uh, loss of 2 million healthy life years annually in Europe. That is about 200 billion uh, 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 euro per year. And uh, this effect is comparable with the road traffic injuries and the cost is similar to the gross domestic product of Cyprus. And also 200 million uh, people uh, in Europe live with allergies, asthma and COPDs. Somehow this participant screen is coming on my screen. I don't know why. Um, anyway, um, and also the you know the any uh, unexpected events, uh, for example, COVID nineteen cost in Denmark were thirty thousand healthy life years, only attributable to poorer quality. So, here we have to uh, consider that the effects of air quality are not only related to the air quality that is indoors but also outdoors. So. There has to be uh, 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 any uh, actions taken to improve not only air uh, quality indoors, but also the air quality outdoors. So, to summarize this, what I said is high indoor air quality is beneficial. Many people think, okay, to achieve or to create high indoor environmental quality is very costly. Well, I mean, there is certain uh, investment necessary, but that will bring benefits. No investments, or if we uh, compromise or basically neglect uh, indoor environmental quality in any actions related to the built environment, will cost us much more than uh, our investments to improve indoor environmental quality. So. Poor indoor environmental quality costs a lot, while high indoor environmental quality is beneficial. This is how we should look at those results. So now many people think, okay, we have so many parameters. 
And um, can we measure those parameters? Um, of course, we can measure, and actually we should measure those parameters. They should be a part of any evaluation of the quality of the building. Um, well, <coughs> these are just few examples of what can be measured with respect to all the parameters that define indoor environmental quality with respect to thermal environment, acoustic environment, light, and indoor air quality. And of course, the discussion here is mainly about indoor air quality, but uh, we know the main unsafe exposures, and those main, main unsafe exposures can be measured and that have been defined by the uh, uh, WHO air quality guidelines, which define the set of pollutants that can be in the first place um, um, regulated, and uh, there could be strict guidelines uh, for those pollutants to reduce their um, um, negative health impacts. Of course, this list does not include infectious agents and they should be added to that list. But IEQ monitoring results in abundant benefits. Uh, and this is something that we should not forget. So, of course, monitoring of indoor environmental quality, again, will um, incur some costs but it will bring a lot of benefits. It will provide data for all building height stakeholders and additional incentives for improvement of indoor environmental quality because we will know what the indoor environmental quality is. It will create benchmark reference and for the building database so that from this benchmark, new solutions can be developed. It will monitor performance of buildings, so compliance and maintenance, it will provide us uh, input to sustainable investments, because if you create a benchmark, if you know how the buildings are performing, and then, of course, technological advancement, it, they will provide uh, input to control and input to energy simulations that, so that um, the reducing the performance gap uh, can be uh, achieved. Uh, not to mention the uh, input to economic calculation. I provided you with some uh, information about how indoor environmental quality can affect work performance, learning, sleep. So that could be an uh, important input to any economic eval evaluation that uh, should be done. And finally, that this will demonstrate somehow invisible indoor environmental quality. So it will provide information to the building occupants. This is a very important aspect of that. No, no monitoring cre uh, will, cre will not tell the occupants of the buildings anything, but if we have monitoring, then we will inform occupants that they can feel secure no, at no risk in their buildings. However, at the at today we don't have any uh, labeling uh, solutions for buildings, uh, for building indoor environmental quality. There have been some attempts that to create some um, uh, rating schemes. On the left, you see the rating scheme for residential building that uh, has been created in Denmark, and it's called uh, IEQ Compass. And is it asset rating? So it is basically rating the the level that can be achieved with the installed solutions uh, in the building. And on the right, there is a tail uh, a rating scheme that also was developed, uh, basically was developed in Denmark and France. And then it is a performance metric, which actually uh, uh, provides information on the actual performance of a building with respect to indoor environmental quality. But basically, this type of labeling schemes are necessary for the building. And then the only way how we can implement those <laughs> is through the monitor. So just to summarize my talk, is IQ in building is crucial part in efforts to achieve the secure and sec to sec uh, uh, achieving sec to secure public health and sustainability. So we cannot talk about public health and we cannot talk about sustainable developments uh, when neglecting indoor environmental quality. So any regulation should actually include those elements. And decarbonization of buildings should not compromise indoor environmental quality. Again, that would mean that monitoring is important. The consequences can be costly. And I showed you what could what are already the consequences and what could be the benefits. So monitoring of indoor environmental quality in all buildings should be mandated as a benchmark to provide information on performance, compliance, to improve and advance methods for indoor environmental quality control, 
and last but not least to inform the public. So again, decarbonization and indoor environmental quality should go hand in hand. And this is the prerequisite for sustainable development. Thank you for my uh, for your attention. And I'm uh, looking forward to address some uh, questions now. Unfortunately, I'll have to run for another meeting, so I cannot stay through the panel discussion, only through the beginning. Yes, thank, thank you, Pavel, for this um, excellent presentation. And, um, and yes, for the audience, um, it's, um, it's a possibility to write to the chat. So please write your questions to the chat. Pavel can right now take a cup, couple of questions and, and then indeed we, we are using a chat also for the panel discussion later. All right. I will quickly address the first question. The first question yes, is from please Oliver. Go on. Jung, uh, thank you for the, this is an excellent question. Given the human aspects related to IQ, is the EPVD the best policy tool to be used at EU level? Well, uh, of course, we, we could have a separate policy on IQ. However, um, uh, we are undertaking actions to improve the energy performance of our buildings. And in that, uh, with that uh, in mind, we need to implement indoor environmental quality as a part of that change. So this is why the EPPD should contain those uh, aspects. And uh, developing a new policy for indoor environmental quality can take several years. And then anyway, it would have to be somehow merged with uh, other policies related to the uh, actions taken uh, or for any regulations for buildings. So I think at this moment, this is probably the best way how we can address the aspect of indoor environmental quality we, because we have that uh, or that directive in place, which actually, which Klaus will say in a moment about this, uh, is actually referring to indoor environmental quality uh, in many places. Well, uh, well, thank you, thank you, Pavel. Uh, so um, I, I don't see any any other questions, um, uh, sure. and I think Thanks. I think we need to proceed. Well, with the sorry, I've taken more time, but uh, I think it's it's important. Yes, to, this to, this is important. Yeah. Time is running, and our Next speaker is um, Klaus Handel. Uh, Klaus is coming from the EVIA European Ventilation Industry Association. And um, Klaus will tell us how IAQ is um, included in the EPPD recast and which changes actually have been currently been discussed and how, how, it, how it needs to be. Uh, included in in the directive. So, Klaus, please go on. Thank you very much, Derek, and thank you to everybody for uh, I would say inviting me as a speaker here. I hope you can hear me, but I think there's an issue with my camera. Not everybody might see me. Yeah, it's still an issue with your camera, but we, okay. we can we can hear you, and and there is a photo of you. And we have a photo slide, of me, so, so we, we can yeah. also see you. Yes. So th thank you very much. I could not solve it during that meeting for the time being. Thank you very much. So I hope I get the remote now. Yes. Um, I will give you some. I would say short. Um, information about the EPPD recast, and I think most of the text is based on the Parliament's proposal, which has been developed uh, spring this year. But we all know ongoing now is the trialogue uh, where we member states and uh, the Parliament and the Commission try to, I would say, found a compromise solution, which, uh, which is uh, somehow uh, considering all the needs of the member states as well. Looking at the draft, which was published in uh, March, I guess this year from the Parliament, everybody looking for indoor environmental quality or indoor air quality parameters have been quite happy because uh, the Parliament has set quite ambitious targets on, I would say, requiring environmental quality parameters, setting minimum requirements on that topic, 
So everybody I would say dealing with in the environmental quality parameters have been quite happy looking at the uh, proposal coming from the European Parliament. You see here more than 12 uh, um, uh, articles are dealing somehow with indoor environmental quality parameters and I would say how they can be implemented in the calculations or in the insurance of good indoor, indoor environmental quality in buildings. So, looking at the first impressions uh, which are known from the trilog uh, version, you all know, which are, um, or, and other people might not, that in the past, um, the uh, the council, that means member states, have been very reluctant in implementing new issues. And uh, what we know about the uh, current process, which is not public, where we do not have, I would say, uh, a clear documentation what is ongoing, but we can found on the discussions with some members of the trialog what is ongoing. So. Uh, there has been a determination that indoor conditions are outside of the scope of the EPBD, which is based on, I would say, energy impacts. Uh, I come later at the end on that topic. And uh, the second thing, key important, was that there is a high responsibility in national competence on that topic. So I would say, uh, member states or the council um, does not agree that there is a guidance directive from the European Commission. What we also know is uh, we have two, I would say, important parameters, which is the indoor quality and indoor environmental quality. So it looks like that uh, indoor air quality, hygiene and health aspects might be deleted somehow or shifted and uh, only some basic indoor environmental quality parameters might be used uh, and not the wide range as tabled in Article 11a. I can later to that. So, and there are some other issues um, on that. Possible there might be a new revision clause that in the next EPBD, a wider range of indoor air or indoor environmental quality parameters might be considered. Looking in detail, uh, what is ongoing, I, I identified uh, with green, red and yellow flags on the side what the impression is, what currently the council outcome, uh, the trilogue outcome might be. So subject matter and cope, um, subject matter, uh, I would say more or less it might stay that uh, it will focus a little bit on the indoor environmental quality parameters, but not specify quite in detail what this might be. Quite happy that uh, we have been um, a new, uh, I would say, definitions what the EPBD understands for indoor environmental quality, and I think more or less what we understand as as also Pavel told us before, it's air quality, thermal comfort, lighting, and acoustic, and all of this affecting health and well being. We might expect that the aspect of healthy indoor climates might be somehow deleted. And this is also uh, referred in Article 5, where we, I would say, might expect more focus on indoor environmental quality because this gives the, I would say, member states more uh, flexibility and uh, healthy indoor climate might somehow be deleted or, or reduced. Aspects of the national building renovation plans, I would say Europe is mainly built and we come up from situation identified like here where we have leaky building where we can say in, in residential aspects, more or less, the leakage of the building is enough to ventilate. We come to, I would say, a high efficient building modernized and uh, with, uh, I would say, not an automatic leakage ventilation rate which seem to be sufficient, but exactly this is the case what we want to have. And uh, we would like to reduce 
the, uh, the avoidable leakages, but we have to come to a situation where in the environmental qualities, let's say coming from manual uh, switched aspects like an opening window to more target oriented systems like ventilation systems with demand control and or heat recovery. But aspects on health, I would say also, I guess, on molding from the building side might be deleted. I come later again to that topic. We all know new buildings uh, can build and construct it according to the current, I would say, uh, standards and uh, requirements might be quite tight. So it is key important that um, from the design phase and also from the calculation, energy calculation phase, environmental quality parameters, I would say, uh, are present. But again, here we might see more on the environmental quality and recommendations and less on minimum requirements on healthy indoors. So this is what we can expect a bit for new buildings. For me, key important also determination, the situations in uh, existing buildings, a renovation part passport should guide uh, the use of the buildings in the right directions. But this should not only focus on uh, energy aspects as well on healthy and in the environmental quality. So it might stay somehow that further information might be given. But I think uh, on, on health and in the environmental quality uh, and, and health aspects might as well delete it in that documentation in that article. The importance is, I would say, uh, if we look at the indoor air quality, technical building systems, uh, these systems shall monitor and regulate the indoor environmental quality. As Pavel said, monitoring is a key issue to raise awareness, but monitoring does not automatically uh, give a solution for that. And if we understand uh, the interpretation of the Commission that monitoring and regulation, regulation of environmental quality means that we have devices which can provide this service. It does not mean only we can, I would say, having uh, manually opening windows on that topic, but we also need devices that ensure, for example, good indoor air quality and monitoring is not enough. On Article 11, uh, I would say also this is challenged because some member states fear also an over-regulation of the um, Commission. But um, the status on that topic, I have no further information. And together with uh, Article 11a, uh, on which we have been very happy because this was an initiative of the uh, uh, Parliament to strengthen indoor environmental quality parameter and additionally give lists of indicators that shall be measured in the building and at least to be included to consider healthy indoor climate. So as Pavel said, many of the parameters important for healthy indoor climate might be somehow measurable and can be, I would say, used for further actions with ventilation systems, demand controls. But as I understood, currently Article 11a is under heavy challenge and it might be somehow combined with Article 11, and many of the aspects introduced in Article 11a might be deleted. As I understood, maybe carbon dioxide and temperature internal comfort might stay somehow, but other important um, parameters highlighted here in red might be <coughs> deleted and not clearly shifted to Article 11.
So also uh, the further consideration that the Commission is entitled or empowered to adopt delegated acts um, to supplement, I would say, a framework for calculation and indoor quality standards has been is also under challenge and um, also the mandatory requirements in, uh, in Chapter 4 uh, for the member states. I would say this might not stay because uh, there is uh, a regulation issue and uh, competence uh, currently given to the member states, which are somehow reluctant. To strengthen a bit, I would also say that further information on indoor environmental quality parameters might be implemented in the EPCs. Pavel showed uh, an, an example made in, in Denmark, uh, I would say, on, on, that, um, on that parameters. More or less, this is based on EN 16798, which we come later on that topic. Also, EVI introduced for residential ventilation buildings and indoor air performance label, which is a voluntary addition to the energy label of the commission of such a device. And this is ready prepared, has been introduced, and the um, industry is working on the implementation of such a label to give further guidance and further information about the ventilation performance in residential buildings equipped with ventilation systems. So this all would also entitle a bit more consumer to raise awareness on the needs of ventilation. I would say inspections and uh, further requirements, for example, uh, on particle matters and uh, on the inspections of systems, I would say this might stay inspection parameters and further aspects um, on air pollutant emissions, particles or whatever, I think this is under challenge. No, oh, no further inquire, no further knowledge about what happens with the annexes. We have also here uh, the link between energy calculation and indoor environmental quality. I, I think I have not to highlight that this is the key importance. Without knowing and without classifications of the indoor environmental quality parameters, the energy demand, the calculated or measured energy demand will never be comparable. So I never understood where there is so many, I would say, uh, rejections on the environmental quality parameter, because if you calculate energy consumption, it's always essential to know about the indoor environmental quality parameters, because otherwise the results will never be comparable. You all might know that the EN 16798 part one um, is currently highlighted in the annex as a key standard to uh, develop a parameter or uh, to determine parameters for indoor environmental quality. And this standard will be revised according to the needs of the EPBD, but also according to other needs we raised in the 15 years where this standard exists. And this standard will be split it into, I would say, four parts, which are determining, determine, <laughs> determining thermal comfort, air quality, lighting, and acoustics. And this is clearly shifted to the responsibilities of the relevant of the of the TCs. That means for indoor air quality, it's TC 156, and for thermal comfort, it's TC 371 as well for lighting and acoustics. As a summary, I would say I would say somehow what we have learned from this process again. I think that's the third process. Uh, what we, can we expect in terms of in the environmental quality? The European Parliament has always made far-reaching demands in this area. So these, it, I would say, for consumer views or building user use, the European Parliament is always quite motivated to have uh, high requirements also on building environmental parameters. Uh, but these have been regularly trimmed or deleted by the EU councils, by the member states. 
for my understanding, I'm not a lawyer and an advocate, but for me, the reason is clearly stated at the very beginning. The position of the parliament here is weak because the directive competence in the member state, because the directive competence is in the member states or regions. I have had a quick look and I said, I'm not a lawyer, but the legal base for the EPBD is, I would say, energy. It's energy, but in, in the Lisbon Treaty, looking at Article 194, which is the legal base for EPBD, is also clearly stated that this shall not affect the member state's right to determine the conditions for exploiting its energy resources. So it's clearly stated in Article 194, which is the legal base, that the member states have, I would say, key rights. And there is nothing written from health and in the environmental quality aspects. So at the next revision, or when we try to revise, we should also check with lawyers and advocates whether there might be a need of a dual legal base, including, for example, Article 191, which is uh, providing uh, protection on human health, or Article 168, which is high level of human health protection shall be ensured in the determination. So in the next steps, we might, I would say also clarify at the very beginning of the process that we have chosen the right legal base for our EPVD, because this is challenged now. This card has been, I would say, drawn now, for example, from Germany, from my, mem from my home country, which is quite reluctant in accepting I would say, in the environmental quality parameters in the EPBD. Yes, for me, I have nothing to say that if we build new and uh, refurbished buildings, fan assisted ventilation systems with heat recovery, demand control, have the power to protect the building and have high hygiene and well being aspects together with low energy demands. Thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Klaus, for this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think, um, as you will stay in the panel, when uh, questions can be addressed uh, to, the, to the panel, and um, we can continue to our, uh, our panel discussion. Uh, so there, there were already questions about the slides. Yes, the slides, uh, slide deck will be will be available, and this will be available in the RIFA web page. Uh, this is very likely under the events you can find uh, all the slides of this webinar. So um, in in the panel discussion, uh, we we will do so that first the panelists. Uh, have a possibility for a very short introduction, uh, which can include a couple of uh, slides. And um, I, I would like to start this introduction by, by myself. Uh, so uh, uh, can I have a next slide? And then yes, after, after that next panelists uh, will continue. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, what what will be the uh, challenge in in this recast? So the challenge is especially coming from the renovation wave targets, which uh, actually uh, so so the objective is to double and to deep deepen the renovation. And we speak, for instance, uh, uh, renovation of 35 million units of apartments in in EU. So these are highly big volumes and um, when having such uh, uh, massive renovation ongoing, this indeed will uh, provide also a challenge for, for ventilation and uh, indoor air quality and so on. So next slide, uh, please. Um, I uh, yeah, uh, about the European building stock, it, it has been estimated that actually 75% of the existing building stock has poor energy performance. And uh, to be more specific, 
uh, in the directive, we speak about worst, worst performing buildings. And these worst performing buildings, so in average, they, they should be according to the EPC, so Energy Performance Certificate classes, which will belong to class E, F, and G. So, and these worst performing buildings, if these classes are equally distributed, would um, correspond roughly to 43% or something like that. So basically we speak about very high renovation volumes what are needed, basically half of existing building stock to be renovated by, by 2050, showing um, how big this um, challenge is. Next slide, please. Uh, so I I picked up one example from Estonia, uh, and Estonia represents very well European average when we speak about existing deep renovation rates. Uh, GRC has estimated uh, that existing uh, deep renovation rates today are only. 0.2.3 percent of existing building stock per year, deeply renovated, and as you can see from the graph below, uh, there is mostly light renovation. What we can see, and uh, some medium medium renovation, and very very little deep renovation. What is common practice in almost all member states. And indeed, we will need more of these deep renovation. So a kind of energy weighted renovation rate has been estimated to be 1 to 1.2% 1 in residential and non-residential buildings. So this energy weighted percentage is a bit better. Uh, but coming to this example from, from Estonia, when we take uh, how many multifamily apartment buildings need renovation, we get a figure about 22,000 buildings. Then we need to estimate how many of these will be in use in 2050. So when, when we will see that 17,000 will be in use, uh, 3,000 already renovated, then 14,000 uh, to be renovated by 2050. And if we check uh, existing current deep renovation rates, what is about 0.8% in Estonia, we, we will see that this is only 200 buildings per year, and this is not enough to fulfill this target. So it, it, it needs a bit more than to be doubled, to be increased to 1.9% in, in this Estonian example. And to do such a deep renovation when good incentives are needed in Estonia renovation grants, so it's a direct financial support uh, for the housing associations, what has been used, and when indeed this funding and financial commitments also would be needed, what will be a big challenge. And indeed, if uh, volumes are so massive, then it is also important that these renovation concepts and process are standardized as much possible and modular and industrial solutions would be, would be used. And also the workforce and the supply chain by the industry, these will be evidently the challenges. So in, in this um, photo, you can see that the ventilation system has installed on the facade ventilation ductwork before the building will be insulated. So it's highly important that uh, ventilation is taken into account in these renovation works, because otherwise, if the windows will be replaced, uh, building envelope will be insulated, it will be very airtight and existing natural ventilation system will not operate anymore. So it's highly important that in, in the case of a deep renovation, ventilation systems will be installed and preferably indeed uh, heat recovery ventilation systems when good indoor air quality can also be maintained. Next slide, please. Um, when we we speak about um, zero emission buildings, what is a target for new buildings? 
uh, it is a good comparison, but uh, worst performing buildings belonging to EPC class G, these can take as much energy as in the case of a 10 uh, zero emission building. And this indeed indicates that it is highly important to renovate these uh, uh, worst performing uh, uh, buildings. Next slide, please. At, at the same time, in the zero emission buildings, perhaps the challenge is not uh, so big uh, uh, because uh, in new buildings, you, you can expect that adequate technical systems will be, will be installed. But, but yes, from my side, I, I would list uh, three main challenges uh, regarding uh, IEQ. Uh, so uh, these instruments, how to improve uh, energy performance of buildings in the directive, very important instruments are these MEPS, so minimum energy performance standards. And then it really is a question how IAQ can be, uh, can, can be maintained and improved when such a step-by-step -step renovation will be conducted, because MEPS is not uh, dealing with a deep renovation but rather it, it wants to increase the energy performance of these worse uh, performing buildings to EPC classes to E and D, something, something like that. And then indeed deep renovation and major renovation, uh, then it, it would be highly important that um, IAQ requirements uh, should push to, to install new ventilation systems, especially in the residential buildings. Otherwise, these buildings would be deeply renovated and there will, would, wouldn't be any air chains left if these buildings will be very airtight. That's, um, that's quite an, uh, evident what can happen. And finally, when we speak about the zero emission buildings, when we are speaking more it is not anymore a question of a technical building systems installed. We can be assured that these systems are installed, but how the demand control and uh, smart operation can be organized in a way to achieve a good energy performance in, in practice. So I, I think we, we will try to tackle these challenges in our, our panel uh, discussion and then we can continue with the uh, introduction of next panelists. So next slide, please. Yes, and our next pan panelist is coming from the system air. So Karsten, please um, go on with your introduction. Yes, thanks um, for participating at the panel discussion. Um, maybe just shortly, um, um, yeah, we are at um, a producer or from the side of the producer actually looking on the topic of indoor environmental quality, mainly for our purpose on the area of indoor air quality, because that is actually one of our main topics, uh, which we have inside and, um, uh, a building which we can influence actively uh, due to the setup of the products we uh, produce and we develop um, that we are matching there all the qualities and the issues which are mainly needed to provide fresh air and actually to what already Pavel did uh, point out to actually uh, influence the the climate inside due to moisture, also our humidity, um, reduce noise to actually provide products which have like one of the main issues in um, uh, being not uh, loud or, or quiet in, in the use. And so uh, within that um, yeah, framework um, for producers, it's quite important in a way that we have uh, when we look on the recast of the EPPD to have um, like a common understanding and not additional barriers in, in, in different, um, I would say in different uh, countries within Europe, that we stick to one energy performance of buildings directive in the recast then later on, uh, where we actually 
adopted that as a regulation later on uh, based on existing standards which we have and as producers with a high quality we also assume that there is an, a need in a way to have an independent certification um, which provides us um, really good quality and which states also good quality of the products we have launched into the market and that we are like ourselves actually taking the responsibility to have really high products which will match the highest qualities uh, or the highest demands in um, energy recovery while taking good fans, uh, taking good energy um, recovery products. And for example, Oilrement in this case has their quite good program where actually then the clients later on also can um, look or the engineers and the, the users of systems can use, uh, can see uh, what about the quality issues that are available and what can be used um, to actually uh, in renovation or in new buildings to, to choose the, the right product to get the highest possible actually indoor air quality with uh, good values. Just maybe that as a st statement at the beginning. Thank you. And uh, let's move to our next panelist. Yeah, Klaus Handel, once again, <laughs> you, you cannot see a video, but once again, you can see a photo. Yes, Klaus. Um, you you yeah. can send hello again. Uh, yeah, you know, I can send hello again. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Also, uh, having part of this panelist, I would, I would also, I would say, summarizing what I said before. We, we have learned a lot, as Pavel already said, from airborne infections from issues uh, made in in the environmental qualities which are weaken our i would say performance of the buildings and the human health so uh, we we had a lot of debates improving indoor environmental and indoor air quality especially to reduce airborne diseases but currently covid has been passed 2 years ago more or less Nobody is dealing anymore, and the energy efficiency is more on the focus again than uh, than the uh, indoor environmental quality. It goes even that far that it looks like that even weaker indoor environmental qualities are somehow expected from many member states to ensure that the energy consumption is reduced. But I would also say our industry or all of us can provide very good solution where we can reach both targets, better indoor environmental quality, better monitoring, better controls, and better insurance of indoor air quality with a high saving. So it's not an automatically issues. What we have learned in the past from the window, more ventilation means more window opening and more energy losses during ventilation. We can also ensure that this, I would say, energy losses through ventilation go to nearly zero because it's re recovered and uh, controlled by individual parameters like CO2 or VOC control. So I would say, again, we have to strengthen, again, our public and our lobby to go for the next steps and also to hopefully implement in that trialogue phase a promising environmental quality, I would say, challenge. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's move to the next panelist. Uh, so, Henk Kraneberg uh, from Taiken. Well, of Daikin, I think everybody will uh, will know. I'm senior manager there and also more deeply involved in the EPBD discussions uh, going on on, uh, on different levels. And, and in that sense, I, I also like to wrap a, a little bit what's happening in the marketplace. We see that we started from the energy efficiency first uh, principle. And that principle is still standing and we are also fully supporting uh, that. That must be very clear, but step by step, elements are uh, added on in uh, terms of the uh, zero emission uh, buildings, so environmental performance, the global warming potential of a building, the whole life CO2, it was already uh, called. And now more attention is uh, also going to the indoor environmental uh, quality. And these are all very proper aspects 
And if we look at human rights, I would say already, we have to look at from a human perspective. It, it's also obvious because we are all entitled on, on a safe, comfortable, healthy shelter for yourself, for your family, uh, for your children, but also for all the next generations to come. So we talk a lot about welfare and uh, well-being. And as also Karsten said before, in the industry already a lot of technology is there and can already be adopted. Uh, but is it known? Is it, is it, are people aware about it? Do the uh, perceived value as it uh, should be? So there it seems to be there are a lot of uh, hustles in between. And if I look at the uh, European political scene, it looks very much when we are now also in the Krylox and the period before, they are looking at the poor person in the social housing, what is affordable for them. On the other side, we also see we have a lot of technology that can really be state of the art in a high end building and high end uh, hospital. And how can that be brought together within this EPD re recast? Probably that is not possible if you do not properly target at, uh, at the target groups. And if you do not properly also define how to measure it in, in terms of standardization methodologies uh, you use. So to make it also possible to communicate it to, uh, to the market. So partly this is a success in some of the standards as they are referred to in Annex 1, but for a lot of elements and also on indoor environmental quality, it is not that clear yet. And so why should we do if this is not that clear at the moment? And why should we spend this money? We cannot afford it at this moment. So we have this one euro, how can we spend it? Where should we, uh, we spend it? And for which purpose is this? Uh, for the poor rental person in, in the social house or the high-end uh, academic uh, hospital. There are a lot of differentiations in the market. And I think as an industry, we have to support this uh, trade-off and make it clear, make it more uh, tangible. Uh, sometimes go for the low-hanging fruit and we cannot achieve perhaps the maximum. That can be done by 2050. We may need uh, steps uh, in between. But key for all is that we have to Cross the message, increase its perceived uh, value, and also make it very tangible. So to make, come up with uh, EPBD standards that are properly uh, supporting uh, this whole exercise we are in. But thank you very much. Thank you. So next panelist is uh, Risto Kosonen, um, RIFA board member. Risto, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jarek. If I starting for that, that um, we are now planning to implement a lot of technologies in the buildings, and uh, we have a little bit challenges that currently that all of them are, are working as they have designed. So this requires commissioning. Have to done it well, and this commissioning is not only what happening in the handover way phase, but it also have to cover for the pre-designed phase to the occupied buildings. And then we're coming back for the demand of the monitoring and uh, data analytic, how, how the system actually works there. We know all already in the previous experience that many high, high class buildings, which are ranking to A class buildings, the Perception of thermal conditions and indoor quality could be level of 30% or even higher. So we have a lot of people who are not satisfied for the conditions and that have to have to also to consider. Then when we're looking for the near future, this data analytic, we don't getting any benefits of that if we don't really guarantee the system performance. So mechanical things have first to check. In the in the future, we have a, make a link for the HVAC systems and buildings for the smart energy systems, and that requires smart readiness and smart systems there. And that also meaning that maybe we should consider more adaptation for certain level of indoor climate conditions, like what are the accepted sliding off temperatures there for certain conditions when we have lack of the power of the grid. When we're looking for the investments, it's quite obvious that uh, 
retrofitting of modern ventilation systems are quite costly and the payback time is quite long. And if we only focusing for benefits, what we are getting for energy saving, maybe it don't make sense to invest firstly for those items. And that's why we have to consider also the indoor climate and also the health and comfort aspect quite, quite a lot there. When we consider energy efficiency as an entity envelope are coming at today quite more airtight and I think some talks here also mentioned that importance for control the whole entity and indoor climate and envelope together that we are not making poor conditions there. But also we are creating the new problem there because high air tightness also set quite high demand for the balancing accuracy of airflows. And for the existing system, we can easily reach the situation that we created huge pressure difference over the envelope. And we have to make new solutions how we can handle that. Finally, deep renovation, what we are now talking about, is it needed a lot of training staff to conduct those those jobs. But do we have that? Do we really have staff to have able to do those? And also the other thing, if we're looking for the energy improvements in the thing, it's quite obvious that if we save a lot of energy, the tax collection for the government also will reduce. And we are coming to a situation that the government have invented new taxation like real estate. The same thing happened for the electric vehicles that uh, when we don't consume petrol, we have the so problem for that. So energy taxation for the member state level is quite important. Okay, that's my short wrap up for, for this topic. Uh, thanks. And our next panelist, yes, it's uh, Christina. Please go on. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, and thank you very much to uh, Riva for inviting EPE, the European Partnership for Energy and Environment, to speak at the seminar. I chair the Energy and Environment um, Working Group, Energy Efficiency and Environment Working Group. And I also work for Johnson Controls, which I represent in Europe. And I would like to bring a few slides to the discussion here. Our statements are in line with the joint uh, gathering, the joint statement that we adopted together with EPE, with REVA and other associations that are included here in the seminar today. So there were a lot of very helpful thoughts already shared by the participants and very, very thought provoking ideas. What we wanted to discuss as it was just um, presented by a speaker earlier on is that the technologies that help with indoor environmental quality standards that are currently expressed under Article 11a in the EPPD and Article 5, these technologies have proven itself, they are already on the market, and they really help to improve the indoor environmental quality standards. And as we have heard from our professor speaking on in the session earlier, um, indoor environmental quality is a very important issue that helps to really address the human life. If we think about the many hours that we spend in our indoor um, environment and in buildings, that is one. And then we also had this very good question from Oliver Jung who asked, could this not be regulated somewhere else? And the answer to that is, no, it can't because there is one legislation that looks at buildings and that is the EPPD. So really just to um, bring to your attention what can be done. So with the technologies that are market available and exists on the market today, ventilation, filtration, disinfection, monitoring, humification and dehumification, pressurization and isolation, and also service agreements and controls and digital analytics can really help to address indoor environmental quality to removing mechanically particles from the air and also to bring clean air from the outside into 
the indoor environment and exchanging the air from the inside. So these are the technologies that we wanted to bring to your attention, but also really the service agreements that can help in this um, in this aspect. If we can turn to the next slide, please. So um, we also mentioned in the discussion before, so how, how does that work? How, how will the technologies work that really help with filter, filtering and exchanging the indoor air and embedding the indoor air uh, quality? So we see here all the different aspects that can be measured and some of them are captured in Article 11a or are still captured in Article 11a. And it was mentioned earlier in the panel that uh, E-enabled optimization is part, can be part of the solution, and we can demonstrate that it already is uh, part of the solution. And we heard also in this from the speakers before the um, impact on um, health and well-being, but we would also really like to highlight the impact, positive impact on productivity as these solutions can also be used in the, um, in the not only in the um, private environment, but also in the work environment where they can play a role. And Hank said before, perhaps we need to make choices where the solutions should play a role. It's not in, expressed um, directly by the uh, EPBD and also our statement that we have all undersigned as parties here does not differentiate in such a way, but definitely for the work environment, we have data and the professor also mentioned it before that there's a direct link between a better indoor environmental quality and higher performance and productivity because the CO2 content is different um, when the solutions are applied. If we can move to the next slide. So really, and it was also mentioned in the chat here, uh, which was a very interesting point, should we perhaps also look at the sustainability reporting and how should indoor environmental quality uh, performance also part of mandatory sustainability reporting? That's a really, really healthy, a very important aspect here. So it plays a role. There is definitely a shared space for sustainable buildings between the decarbonization and the sustainability of buildings and the indoor environmental quality, which leads to better occupant experience. And um, that really concludes the little um, excurs here that we have done. We would wholeheartedly agree that ESG reporting is an um, important aspect that should also be Amplified, and since we did our joint statement two years ago, the corporate social responsibility debate, the ESG debate has really taken up to new levels and it can be a really good driver to help buildings to perform better, which then has a direct impact of the people that are inside the buildings about 90% of their lives. And with that, I would really like to thank Arriva for the invitation and hand it back to the moderator here. Well, thank you. And our final uh, panelist, Nathan, please go on. Thank you. Um, some really good informative presentations. Um, Thank you for inviting me along. I'm going to raise some awareness around uh, World Ventilation Day. But before I do that, I'd just like to make two points on the previous um, speakers and presentations. How on earth are we going to deliver the EPBD without skills? Um, the previous gentleman mentioned the skill shortage and how we're going to put that through. We need to develop, you know, uh, apprenticeships in uh, indoor air quality. We are expecting engineers of the past become physicians of buildings of the future. There's a massive amount of skills and and upskilling and retraining that we need to do. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll get off the soapbox and uh, get on with a few slides that I've got to put through, please. So next slide, please. So yes, thank you for inviting me along. My name's Nathan Wood and I'm GCP's Indoor Air Quality Task Force Chairman. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm delighted to present to you World Ventilation Day. Um, most of you should hopefully be aware of it. Um, 
I also have a role with uh, BISA, the Building Engineering Services Association, uh, where I'm chairman for the Indoor Air Quality uh, Group. And through collaboration with some amazing core uh, group of committee professionals, we've developed these three guides um, on indoor air quality. And through discussions with BISA's technical director, Graham Fox, he spoke about the need for a ventilation day. Um, further discussions with uh, Professor Kathy Noakes and other people, basically World Ventilation was born and with only three weeks before the actual event took place, we had we had no budget, no real plan in place. Um, so we had a, a lot to do, but through amazing support from professional bodies, universities, environmental group, uh, groups, uh, the worldwide appeal was, was just staggering. Uh, next slide, please. So, as you can see from the initial supported list in this slide, um, the first year was an, an amazing success. The website attracted uh, 15,000 visitors from 75 countries with print media coverage re reaching, I mean, this is unreal, reaching 382 million people across 12 countries within three weeks of it being sort of born to, to, to happening. So, thank you for everybody uh, listed here. Hopefully, there'll be a lot more names added. Um, uh, in, in next month's um, World Ventilation Day. Next slide, please. So here you can see so, uh, some examples for how you can get involved through your businesses and your associations, sharing of information, highlighting new initiative, initiatives, and to showcase what you do to improve people's health within buildings. And I think we need to break down the barrier between preaching to the choir between our own associations and getting this information out into the public domain. We need to generate as much movement and passion that we have here today um, out in the general public as well. Next slide, please. And this is why we need to do it. Too many lives are affected by the harm of, of poor indoor air quality and pollutants in general. We have to do our bit to raise public awareness. We can't continue to wait for people's lives to be taken. Here we've got young Ella Roberta. Uh, the first person in the world to have air pollution listed as a contributory uh, act of her death. And then young Awa Bishak, who died through uh, poor standard living conditions and mold and damp concerns. We can't wait for more people to die. Our health is being affected daily. And I do see that it's our responsibility to do more to raise that profile. Next slide, please. If I may, a bit of a cheeky ask, if you could use your phone, scan that code, that would take you through to the petitions for the UK government to raise um, the uh, the need for the Clean Air Human Rights Bill, or Ella's Law, as it's been uh, called. Please register on there, name and signature, hit the email link that comes through, and you'll uh, add to the signature, uh, signatories to, to get this through to be put in, in government. Next slide, please. And here's the important bit of information. Um, we really want you to get involved. Info at worldventilateday.com. Note the, uh, the 8th and the day is the 8th of November. Thank you very much. Well, um, thank you. And, and yes, um, uh, when, when we can um, take some questions, what we have received um, to the chat, um, and, and yes, um, for the audience, please um, use this possibility to write to the chat uh, when we can address these ones to, to the panel members. And I, I would like to start with a question, um, what is dealing with uh, sustainability reporting? And actually, it's, it's addressed so that what, what and how must be done to make uh, IEQ a mandatory assessment criteria in sustainability reports, so in this ES key uh, reporting. And I, I think this, this, this is a very good uh, question. And uh, yes, uh, Christina is willing <laughs> to provide a to write a comment on. Christina, please go on, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, that was a really good question. And one thing that came uh, to our mind was that the EU taxonomy regulation is currently reviewed and uh, seen, uh, and we can hand in comments to see how it would fit 
uh, into the landscape of uh, taxonomy buildings. So that would be a good idea to perhaps also mention that indoor environmental quality plays a role if buildings are um, considered um, a green or not so green asset. And that may also align with Hank's comment that some types of buildings offer themselves more for um, IEQ than others because um, the taxonomy regulation is targeted mostly at investors, so subject to the legal uh, conclusions which be companies that maintain building stock and are publicly listed on the shareholder market. That's just one idea from us. Yeah, so in this uh, taxonomy context, they, they also need very simple tools to classify the buildings, which, which buildings have good um, indoor environment and which ones do not. And for energy, they can use an energy performance certificate. They know that class A is very good and class G is worst performing. Uh, but similar classification, I think this, this is a one bottleneck. It's not available. There is no official classification for indoor environment. Uh, and, and perhaps this, this is something we, we still need to push to have um, uh, something what, what can be applied based on the European standards to be then a tool in the taxonomy. But, but yes, Henk has raised the hand. Please go on. Attention, because this can be the way how to find the early adopters in the market and how to get the message across, how to increase the perception of the value uh, in the marketplace, because it is, is a very tough challenge that we, uh, that we face. Um, and we also see that, although you refer, Jarek, to, okay, we have some energy performance calculations. In fact, today, yes, we have a couple of standards referred to an annex right. one. If you look country by country, uh, the, the, the comparability is, is very poor and we do not have common standards in place. So we still have a lot of things to do and we have to continue not only to look at the new elements like indoor environmental quality, but also look at the beginning. Which steps did we really pr proceed in a proper way? What can we say? Yes, we did it in a, in a, in a right way uh, till the end. So far, hardly anything is really yeah. done. So we still have a long way to go. And then I fully support, we have to utilize this kind of like um, uh, the company has sustainable, uh, sustainability reporting to use these kind of tools to get the early adapters on board. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Klaus. Please go on. Maybe I can add one special topic. I would say, especially on ventilation and in the environmental or in the air quality issues. I would say sustainability and life cycle calculations on the materials as well. I would say is also there an important issue to to reduce. Uh, I would say further further impacts, but I would also try to clarify in case of ventilation systems if we go for uh, i would say use period of 25 years or even more the impact of the materials on the sustainability impact is lower than five percent so the benefits uh, on energy side as well on co2 side and and well-being are much higher than the impact we have to be aware that many of these life cycle analysis go cradle to gate which means that the operational phase is, I would say, neglectable considered. And we have to ensure that our products or products serving good indoor environmental quality are fairly calculated with a cradle to gate, a cradle to grave approach, meaning that the operational phase is strictly considered. And this is an issue where we have, I would say, to follow up the track and ensure that the commission and regulation is following the right track. Well, well, thank you. And, um, and, and yes, when, when I would like to proceed to, to another uh, Klaus from Denmark, having a question about um, renovation and pointing out that uh, 
for instance, when renovating schools, when good ventilation is not so evident and how to, how to be sure that this renovation wave, what is ongoing, uh, how these, uh, uh, let's say, IAQ will be secured in, in the member states. So, so this, this is likely a question how directive should require that minimum requirements for all important IAQ parameters will be established on national level. And if we don't have uh, such, uh, uh, such um, requirements in force, then it is really a risk that these, uh, uh, for instance, the installation of the ventilation systems is not addressed adequately in the renovation processes. Um, so, um, uh, this is something, um, yes, maybe, maybe I, I would like to ask from the panelists uh, it on more general fashion. Uh, do you see that these uh, requirements in the EPBD are somehow stronger in, in this recast so that uh, every member states need to establish minimum, minimum requirements on national level? Or do you see any any change in these uh, requirements what are now discussed in the in the recast compared to the previous version? And can we expect that these uh, national minimum requirements can be expected in the implementation of a, of a directive? Uh, so there are. Participants have raised hands, but I, I cannot, for some reason, cannot see. So, um, if you were to give an answer perhaps also on the, on the question, I think we have a very good example in, uh, in the Netherlands on, on how the stimulation program has started for schools and really pointing out on the weakness within the schools and how this clearly is then a certain application that are certainly was in the spotlight and where a lot of uh, developments have been uh, uh, that, yeah, have appeared on the, on the marketplace. Uh, Going back to the question of Yarik, I think uh, the initial uh, uh, parliament proposal was very strong indeed with a lot of uh, details. If we hear more or less the, the message is coming from the trialogue, it looks this will not be arranged on the European level. Each member state will have to do by themselves and they can make their own selections. And I think this again points out EPPD, although we have a directive, it is pointing out a direction, uh, but the work has to be done uh, country by, uh, by country. So each of us and each of the national countries will have to secure that uh, that we will do the right things for the right uh, people in the right applications. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Now, now I can see these uh, hands, and uh, I think uh, Karsten Karsten Titmar was uh, was the next one. Please go on. Um, well, not the next one, but I just short want to answer. Um, when we go on regulations directives we always have and we have this i answered um, uh, klaus anderson already in the mail we in germany um had tried even before COVID to set up some kind of guidelines for planning for indoor quality and things for schools to provide a good um, atmosphere in actually in in uh, academic buildings and um, in there, we just have the, the issue that we are talking about different, um, yeah, different areas where we have um, on one side, the people who are responsible for the buildings and the, um, the, the management of the building. And then the other side, um, um, the money, <laughs> the money, which is available there. So. In this case, it's always quite a big gap because the 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 uh, the German um, Umweltbundesamt um, 
which is the national institute actually, they can just advise and give things and links, but they cannot put it in the law. But if we actually try to, and this would be also from, from the industry side, a good solution. So if we try to roll out something, I think it is important that we roll it out and find a common understanding within Europe so that not for all different countries, we have different demands, different uh, volumes, for example, which we which we set up for ventilation. Actually, we are all human beings in a way, and I think that's that's the task. What we have to do from industry and all the engineers together to set up the right requirements um, that we have then same solutions in all countries in a way, same minimum requirements which we should actually fulfill. And everybody can do more if they want to, but um, at least to set up minimum requirements, I think that's the need for the future in a way to secure good indoor air environment and then further on later also uh, indoor, yeah, indoor environment quality. Yes, thanks. And um, yes, Chris, Christina, please um, go on next hand. Oh, thank you very much. Absolutely agree with Hank's uh, statement of earlier that um, the initial EPPD coming from the parliament was very strong. And now, because maps are measured at a national level, the EPPD has lost somehow its teeth. However, we continue, and that includes all the organizations that are represented here today, to stand uh, behind our manifesto, which we have also shared in the chat here so that we advocate for the inclusion of Article 11a. And we heard from our speaker before that there are still some aspects of indoor environmental quality that are remaining in the text, and that's a very important signal for us. And we also have a very interesting discussion in the chat going on that explores other ideas, such as an IAQ label, um, and also, um, we mentioned taxonomy before, so there are definitely also additional measures that can be taken to enhance the indoor environmental quality um, as, an, as an important part of how buildings really uh, serve as our shelter during most of our lives. Thank you. Thank you. So, before we will go on with next hands, uh, I, I would like to raise um, there are a couple of good um, comments and questions in, in the chat. So um, it, it's good remark that there is already existing European air quality index uh, with a color code. Uh, so it's a nice uh, color scale uh, air quality index, but this is indeed for ambient air. Uh, showing um, uh, perhaps a direction, but something similar can be built up for the indoor environmental quality. And and this this idea is followed by by Jaap Hogeling. He is asking uh, uh, what the panel is um, is thinking. Uh, could the panel support to import, to include the IAQ label into the revised um, indoor climate standard? So referring to EN seven. Uh, 16798 part part one, which is under the re revision. So uh, um, let let's say if 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 Klaus and Risto you want uh, want to to continue, yes, please address uh, this question also. I, I think as a panel we we really can support that this type of uh, label is uh, is something what is what is needed. And this is not enough currently covered in existing European standards. Maybe should I start? Yeah, I, I can. Yes, Klaus, uh, yes, go on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I fully agree with the comments made of, of Jaap. Yet uh, I would say somehow monitoring uh, elements, rising awareness are a key issue to, to I'd say, to interest people what is ongoing. But I would also say what we learned on, on, on COVID, rising awareness and uh, having, I would say, red, green and yellow, um, um, I would say, lamps going on when there is something wrong would also, I would say, people get tired of that because if, if they have to act 
on, uh, I would say, a yellow or a red light in the unit and they have to open the window. It might happen that, for example, in a school, uh, the the teacher has to open the window every five minutes. So the the teaching process is interrupted and it will, it will be more, I would say, um, attraction to the ventilation than to the stuff itself. So I would say, yes, um, raising awareness is key, but we should not forget that uh, the issue on providing solutions, which are, I would say, automatically going on on that topic, are, I would say, the solution and not only rising awareness. Yes, um, thank you. So um, I, I think as, as, a, as a panel, we have now used um, almost our time and actually it was planned so that uh, Risto, Risto can make a kind of a summary and I, I, I would be happy to give a word to, to Risto for uh, concluding remarks and perhaps addressing also this uh, discussion about the uh, indoor environmental quality label. So please, uh, Risto, go on. Okay, thank you. Maybe before the summary or conclusion, I continue this labeling that uh, uh, the thing is that we have quite different situations in different member states. What are the, the um, demand for ventilation, airflow rates, and also what are the accepted systems there? But we go back like um, Nordic conditions, like a Finland, I think the systems, technically, they are quite good, I think. But there is a missing that uh, the process is failed. It's meaning that the design commissioning and finally the occupancy phase is failed. And for that, the labeling, I think, is a good tool that we measure something and monitor into something. For that, a comment for that. But maybe for the conclusion, I think there's a lot of a lot of discussion here. And I'm not sure, can I share my screen here? Is that possible? Maybe it's not possible. Okay, it doesn't matter. I can we can I can talk with that. I, I think there's uh, two talks like uh, in the two keynote talk about importance of the indoor quality, and it's quite obvious that effect quite a lot of work and learning and sleep. So it's quite well known proof that the indoor environment quality is beneficial and poor indoor quality condition can cost a lot. So that also rise of the demand for the monitoring of indoor conditions and guaranteed that it, everything is working as designed. There is also talking about energy saving and we don't need to sacrifice into equality if we make a smart design solution and using the technology that is available. And also this indicate for the talks that the labeling scheme for indoor quality is maybe in the future is necessary, is the must that we have it there. There is also talk about this existing building stock and important for that and uh, we have to have high demand for the deep renovation in the near future. And we have a lot of buildings which are needed improvements. Then exactly for this EPP recast, I think there's still quite a lot open open things and many things are under discussion and it could be that for the draft significant changes will, will be expected in the near future. And also there is indicated that revision work for the existing standard is needed. So panel discussion, I think, highlight maybe quite a similar issues for this deep renovation and uh, poor performance. Quality control of the product and system in the market should be emphasized. Energy demand could drive poor into a climate if we don't utilize previous learnings of the meaning of ventilation that we have learned for the for the COVID airborne conditions. So there's a many proof technologies and value-added service in the market available, but are they well known for the auto expert and professional in the Europe? 
Then, of course, demand for different buildings are quite different. Are we talking about social housing or are we talking about hospitals or high high quality buildings? They may be needed different solutions and more emphasized. And finally, I think we want to create occupied experience that also mentioned, I think, at least two talks there. So we have also think about entity like how what is the link for the building envelope and ventilation system and how they work together and also in the future these smart energy systems how we can work together and what is accepted for conditions maybe in the future we can more utilize big data and artificial intelligence and go in the direction of data driven buildings but still if it took it for solution it's it's to challenge that how we can make the solution cost effective that improvement for ventilation systems also economical profitable for the building owners and i think one big element here that we have a lot of work to do it and do we have enough trained staff to conduct the retrofitting in the new future so this kind of point i rise up here thank you for listening so thank you very much uh, Risto and I, I would like to thank um, all the speakers and uh, panelists uh, and um, there is yes, um, as, a, as a final remark uh, ongoing uh, uh, ongoing Riva Brussels summit uh, policy uh, conference on November 14th it's a good time to take a note and to, re to register in, in this event and uh, discussion on EPPT recast will, will continue in this event and it's uh, especially focusing on indoor environmental quality, digitalization and, um, and also on skills in the decarbonization of buildings which are all very important areas. And, and we, we have seen, yes, that um, we have high expectations uh, to the EPPD recast and um, there is a lot of work uh, to be conducted at different levels. It's not only the directive, but we need standardization. We need on national level uh, to, to ensure that um, uh, in new buildings and also in renovated buildings, uh, healthy uh, indoor climate conditions can be achieved. So thank you very much for active attendance and let's keep in touch. This will close our webinar.